Welcome to the On The Top Coaching Podcast, where we discuss new and innovative waves in the sport of swimming. I'm your host, Jason Polano, and today I'm here with Abby Fish of Swim Like a Fish Productions, and she's going to talk a little bit today about the dreaded back-to-breast crossover slash suicide slash bucket turn. So, Abby, what what do you think? What are some, what are things that coaches need to know when it comes to these three different styles of transitions? Well, A, they all have pros and cons to them. Um, Some of them are harder to do, just fundamentally teaching the kids a different movement pattern. Uh, Touch and go turn is like basically the back half of of an open turn. So, there, it, there's an acceleration in learning a touch and go turn versus a crossover turn. A crossover turn is not necessarily normal. Um, and I think a lot of coaches veer away from things that are more difficult to teach, uh, especially if you know the kids are not going to get it, you know, first few practices, maybe in five, six practices. Um, Cause it's hard. This is a new concept. It's out there. It's, we, it requires more education on our parts to be able to teach something because we need to be masters at what we're doing. So if we're going to go for, you know, maybe a simpler version or an accelerated version, if we have a short season, I can see why coaches are like, hmm, crossover turn, we're just going to like, let you sit over there and see what happens with you. And then maybe we'll dabble with you in the future. Yeah, and I think especially after a year of COVID where we're just trying to get our kids back to where they were, or try to take advantage of the time that we have, what limited time we have, that sometimes those transitions are something that can be put on the back burner. But I'd like to say, you know, where I am in Texas, um, we're pretty much maskless. And my school district, I think we're at like 72% of our teachers have been vaccinated. um, And then our numbers have drastically diminished. So I think that we're starting to get back to the point where we can start looking at those fundamental things that are going to be a difference maker in our kids racing. So um, I've got a couple of kids right now. I've got one boy who um, probably an error in my judgment. I worked on a crossover turn with him probably about a week before our regional meet and uh, it backfired and it worked in prelims and uh, in finals, he got disqualified. So um, this is something near and dear to my heart. When I saw you post about it on social media, I was like, okay, I've got to talk to Abby about that. Because mm-hmm. it's something that, for me as a coach, I need to get better at as well, and try to to fix the error that I made with that swimmer that uh, I worked with back in February. So, so mm-hmm. let's start out. What do you think? What are what are what are developmentally appropriate uh, standards for our swimmers to use these three different transitions? Yeah. So I, I mean, a touch and go turn to me. Once you hit the wall and you go in to backstroke and you get the feet up on the wall, that's no different than ready position. So as long as you nail your stroke count and you hit the wall and the timing of all that is good, um, it's not fundamentally like a whole different movement. So like if you're talking for age groupers, a touch and go turn, you could teach a touch and go turn to a six-year-old, an eight-year-old, a 10-year-old. And then kind of once you get over 10, I think is when you can start sprinkling, sprinkling in some different styles of these turns. But It does depend on, you know, how long have they been swimming? Are they proficient in a breaststroke kick? Like, can they do a breaststroke pullout? Um, If they're not great with their pullouts, um, that's a key indicator for me to decide whether or not to progress through a harder turn, because some of these turns require more energy. They may not give you as much oxygen. And so if it's just going to diminish how long your pullout is, then I might sue with the touch and go turn. But I would say anywhere from like 10 to 12 is kind of like the marker there that I would change from touch and go into potentially bucket or suicide turn, depending on what you call it, or now crossover turn status. Yeah, for sure. Um, So you've got a couple of videos that you were going to pull up and show to some of the viewers or listeners. If you go to www.bit.ly slash O-T-T fish, F-I-S-H, and it's all lowercase, Uh, that's going to be where I put this podcast video on YouTube. So um, if you're a listener, you can go ahead and pull that up right now and you can see some of the videos that Abby's provided. Gotcha. So first one, let's just do like a traditional touch and go turn. Are we all good on the screen share there? Yep. You're good to go. Great. Sweet. Um, So, so what do you think? Let's bounce off what I just said. Do you believe touch and goes appropriate kind of from that age range? Do you think it should be taught higher? What's your opinion? No, I do. I think that once a kid is getting into that point where their age group career 
they don't want to be the last one in the water doing the touch and go turn, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I mean, I was a division two college swimmer and we had some guys that were doing touch and go turns and we always kind of like sneered and laughed at them that they couldn't do a crossover or they couldn't mm-hmm. do uh, a bucket turn at the time. But I think that developmentally 10, 12 is a great time to learn. Um, and it's something that athletes are going to learn this step first. This is going to be our, our first progression in that development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, and I love, so like a touch and go turn, as you guys just saw through that slow-mo is it's nothing crazy. I mean, you have to nail your stroke count. You want to have the hand on the wall, uh, so you can get the feet tucked up under the body. And then from there, it's just a matter of getting the feet planted on the wall in a good position for a solid push off. Um, so this is my turn. So I feel like I can critique it pretty hard. Uh, my stroke count was not great. There's actually no flags in what I was swimming. So I'll give myself a caveat there. But I was a little long into my wall. And then as you can see, when I push off, um, the relation of where my hands are to my feet means my body is going to go down. So I love a touch and go turn just because it's, it is so simple. It's a matter of touching, driving the knees and the feet up under the body, getting them onto the wall, and then getting yourself into a streamline that I say when I teach it, that it it can really, really help give you a very dependable push off all the time. Uh, And so versus like a crossover or even a suicide turn, there's so much more happening in those movements that the probability of things going wrong is higher. So when you simplify things, you have a higher probability of doing things well. This is the ironic part, is if you see my push off here, the first thing I do is go straight down. So I'm going to have to U during my pullout and get myself back up to recover from that, um, from the touch on my, on the wall being long. And then also my feet placement on the, on the wall being a bit too high. If we look at this, um, this turn versus a bucket turn, which do you call this a bucket or do you call this a suicide turn? So I've got a I've got a growing aggression on this term between uh, me and the summer league coach in my community. She calls it a suicide turn because uh, you're kind of going into a phase of the turn where you go in blind, and if you've got a shallower pool, uh, I think is where the suicide term comes from. But gotcha. I call it a bucket turn. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I posted as you saw on Instagram and Facebook uh, a comparison video of is actually the same girl doing a suicide slash bucket turn. And it's always funny to me, the people that get so spicy about things that don't matter. And oh, they're no, like, oh, that's turn just... is the, the old backstroke turn that Adolf Kiefer used. Yeah. I yeah. saw a couple comments. And I'm like, man, if you have time in your day to care about how I label something versus like actually giving some knowledge, like what am I doing wrong? Because I don't have time in my day to like troll other people on social media. <laughs> So whatever you call this term, it doesn't really matter. Everybody knows the movement pattern. Um, But I was actually taught this term. I was taught this term right when I was about 12 years old. I remember when it first came on the scene. And I remember my coach and age group telling me that it was a a backflip on the wall. And honestly, as a young swimmer, I loved doing this turn. Like I felt like this turn was so, so, so fun. Um, only issue with it is if you do bring up your hand above your above your head there, the distance of the arm is what you see. Versus on your crossover, you get a little bit more length in the body because you're reaching for the wall and you're on your side. So the head towards the wall, as you said, maybe that's why this was called a suicide turn and also towards the bottom, is very, very close. So when you talk um, that back flip, which is really similar to your front flip and a flip turn. Sometimes people jam this wall like crazy if they're way too close. Cause your momentum is still carrying your body into the wall, even when you stop yourself. Um, so the elbow crunches up even more. And so as you can see here, her body position on the wall, it kind of looks like she's in a squat. She may be sitting in a chair, but where is she going to go? She's just going to go straight down like like I do. Another big thing with this turn comparatively to a crossover turn is the amount of not oxygen that you get. So you touch the wall and then you have to go through that full flip without um, getting any air. And then you have to hold through the pullout. So one of the main things I've noticed with kids who use this turn is that their pullouts are just not very, very long. Um, 
They may get a little bit outside the flags. You can see her body is outside the red, which is where our flags are, but it's not anywhere near half pool. Um, I think that that's well developmentally for me. I think that was my, my rule of thumb this past year with my kids was if you're not capable of doing a crossover or a bucket turn and getting a full pullout in, then you're not ready to do that crossover or bucket turn yet. Um, Mm -hmm. And part of that was apathy on my part that I wanted to get them into a good routine of like proving to me that they're going to do a bucket turn or do uh, do a good pullout off of a touch and go. Um, While really in actuality, it was just kind of me sitting there going, once they're ready, I'll do it. I'm not going to do it right now. I've got too much going on. Um, But I think that when it comes to that natural sequence and development of this turn. Yeah. My opinion is if you're not able to get that full breaststroke pull out, I'd rather you get a full breath and do an open turn. Mm-hmm. Um, that's just my, my thought process. What, what's yours on that, Abby? I totally agree. And I actually think that's when you asked me the standards, it's like pretty much identical to what I said. I, the pullout itself, I mean, the reason we do a pullout in breaststroke or some people argue it's not faster, but the average speed of a breaststroke pullout is still faster than most people's breaststroke swimming speed. So what you do on the wall, how cool you look on the wall, it doesn't really matter as long as we can generate some momentum and generate some speed off that wall. So the push off is the most important part of that entire turn. Obviously, you need to finish a lap and transition to the next lap, but that transition point doesn't need to look cool. It needs to be like replicatable, dependable, and give you a high speed so that way you can carry that high speed for as long as as you can. Uh, When I started coaching at a club team that I assist with in Louisville called Triton Swim Team, uh, no one knew how to do a crossover turn. And I was like, hey, Mike, we should do this turn. And he was like, yeah, that's that's all you. And I've seen... (laughs) So many That's different styles of crossover answer. turns <laughs> in my time here. I mean, the way that kids' brains interpret the motion and the flips and everything, I mean, it can turn into a backwards bucket turn. It can turn into a spin turn. Um, and just as you said with coaches, you know, like I've had kids that have gotten DQ'd from this. And I also think there's a lot of stroke and turn officials that are not really versed on what this turn should look like. And so as coaches, you may be like, eh, try it. We'll see what happens, but that doesn't mean that it's legal. So it does get a little dicey for sure. So let's, let's take a look at the elusive crossover um, compared to everything else. And I literally actually just shot this video about 10 minutes ago. I'm super stoked about it. So it's not even on the gram yet. So for all your viewers, you're getting the first time look at (laughs) this girl's awesome crossover turn. I was pretty proud of this shot. So yeah, uh, Jason, when you talk crossover turns, what's the first thing that you kind of teach the swimmers? I always remember the approach. Yes, the approach for sure. And I think that the biggest issue that my kids have is that when they come into that wall, they're so used to finishing with that hand under their body Mm -hmm. that for the crossover, when they have to go arm over the top, that's a perfect still frame right there where now you're touching with an over the top stroke instead of an under the ear stroke. Mm -hmm. So getting my kids to do that first. And I always try to tell them the, the secret sauce that I was taught was if the official can still see your ear, then you're good. If you Mm -hmm. go over the ear, that's when it becomes an issue on disqualification. So if we can try to finish with the ear visible to the person above you with that final stroke, and I just tell them, take that last stroke into the wall, touch, and then stop. Don't do anything else. That's that's the first step of progression for me. Mm-hmm. And actually, I, I do something similar too. Like I totally see how, you know, she's on her side and she is. She's not past perpendicular here to the water surface. Like this is technically a legal point in her crossover turn. But the key indicator there is what's going on with the hip. And the hip is obviously connected to the ear, similar to what you're saying. So I've seen a lot of kids, you know, they're kind of coming in on their side and then all of a sudden the very, very last point, because they're used to like almost a backstroke flip turn that they flip that hip down and then they go into, um, it's essentially a back, a backstroke turn. It's just done more so on your side than it is done more on a forward flip. So I'll have my kids literally kick into the wall in this position. So they'll kick on their side 
do freestyle all the way till the hand touches and then go into a crossover turn. That's um, one of my favorite drills. And, you know, sometimes they go maybe past, um, you know, uh, perpendicular to the water surface. And, but the goal is to keep the hips up. So it's not totally completely on your side. It's just a little bit airing on uh, more towards your back. Gotcha. 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 And then the next step is the part my kids have the issue with. They don't know where their head goes once they touch the wall. Does mm -hmm. their head tuck under? Does it tuck over? And right here, you can see this girl is going to tuck straight to her knees. And I try to get my kids to think about, it's like a somersault on your side. And mm -hmm. I use that verbiage so often. And then I've had success saying it's more like a cartwheel than it is a flip, like a somersault. And sometimes that's when my kids get it when I say it's like a cartwheel, because you'll see that chin dip down a little bit and it comes kind of over the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always, I always say that it's nose to knees. And then your knees are what will follow through uh, through the air. Um, but yeah, I mean, that that point where you're here, I've seen kids take their heads and go back, you know, behind their yep. shoulder. <laughs> I've seen kind of like a wonky, like side flip situation happening. But one thing I've really been kind of honing in on with the crossover turn is the arm that touches the wall. It actually comes out of the water. So you can see here how that comes out of the water on the recovery. And I feel like if you can get the kids to understand that that above arm should then swing back out as the body rolls, it helps them get through that front flip and then over to the top into their streamline. Um, I had uh, one of my buddies uh, from Australia on a uh, webinar when it was probably about this time last year during COVID. And I was like, hey. I'm not going to say that I am like the queen over here of crossover turns, but I, I need to learn more because I've got kids that need to learn this. And like, this is just not well known. And he's a biomechanist um, in uh, Sydney, Australia, uh, Ryan Hodern. And he came on and he threw all the videos up of these awesome Australian Olympians. And he said one thing to me that really just rung in my ears. And it was when you're going for the wall on the crossover, a lot of times, like, yes, you want to extend the body. Yes, you want to reach. You want to keep the ear out. want to keep the hip out. But he's like, one of the key features is having a deeper touch on the wall. So I've been having my kids really look towards the middle of the T there and reach down, which allows that hand to kind of come and pop out. Um, and I've seen a lot of good success from that. Have you, have you noticed that at all? If I've got my kids touching shallow they they're more wonky than if they get a little deeper um but then it's that kind of that balancing act of when you're deep are you more likely to drift past vertical um, mm -hmm. that's been my my observation with my kids yep 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 no and i agree and when i first stopped the crossover i mean i was with the race club and we would teach like kind of pulling out of your pocket and then coming across the body, hence the name. So it was like you cover your eyes and you'd end up on your, you know, above your opposite shoulder, but that does promote more of a body roll than if you come up and you keep that ear uh, visible, as you said. Um, so yeah, just as much as this turn has been around and kind of visible, uh, I've been dabbling on what exactly I say uh, to get, to get my swimmers to respond well to. And I think that there's a big, like, it's not going to work the same for each kid. Like each kid's going to interpret those, uh, those verbal cues a little bit differently. And I think that trying to make it as visual as possible, like you said, like going across your body or keeping mm -hmm. the ear exposed, that's, what's going to help kids get the, the fine pieces of the drill kind of knocked out by the big pieces. Like they'll get the big movements and then they can kind of refine it back in. Um, yeah. Abby, you've got some really awesome videos. What do you do on your pool deck to try to like quickly, easily get some of that underwater footage for your kids? Yeah. So I would say that like that underwater footage, that's not easy to get. Cause I'm actually like in the water shooting that footage. So there's like specific days and times that I'm like, all right, today's a filming day. But if I'm at practice or I'm going to do a lesson, um, you know, I'll either like stick my phone in the water or I'll stick an iPad in the water or I'll record above water just to give that video feedback and incorporate that in a lesson. Because um, I was actually thinking about this the other day. I had a couple lessons with a couple of my kids that, I mean, I, I practice with every single day. And one parent was like, that's the best private lesson my child says she's ever had. And I was like, 
sometimes I don't feel like I'm reinventing the wheel here. Like I may say something a little bit differently than you, but I, you know, it's like at the end of the day, we all are just trying to connect with our swimmers and we all have the same goal there. So there's no, like, there's no ego involved in this, but I would say that the one thing that I can pride myself on and I do a lot of is always having videos. And so I have this library of videos. So if I was teaching you a crossover turn, I'd be like, ching, 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 check this out. Have you ever seen this or do this drill? And it just accelerates that learning curve so much quicker than if I were to just verbally be giving you feedback the entire time. So I was like, maybe that's why, you know, her daughter said that to her, which I love. I mean, it's very, very nice. But at the same time, I'm like, what's the difference here? And I'm like, well, it's just probably videos. It's literally because I have so many videos and I shoot videos and I talk about videos and <laughs> there's just always videos. <laughs> but you know, and I, I mean, my, I have two careers. I get to be the head swim coach for the school district I work for, but I'm also uh, a curriculum coordinator here in the district. And I mean, something that we're seeing from like a, a human development standpoint is that kids are becoming so much more visual than anything else. Like from the mm -hmm. moment they are children, I've got a two-year-old at home and we just flew to Phoenix, Arizona and back with her. Like you throw the iPad at her and she's good. Like she has something to look at and kind of manipulate. Yeah. But like, that's how like this generation, I call it the 140 character generation, like the 140 character generation has grown up with a device in their hands mm -hmm. and every like children's developmental app is super visual when it comes to like how to follow, how to follow sequences of events. So like, mm -hmm. um, if you've got a, like an, like a educational app, like it will like light up the next thing that they're supposed to go to until they recognize the pattern. Mm -hmm. So kids are so much more adept these days at the visual. Like for me, when I was a swimmer, um, my coach could explain something to me verbally and I picked up on it. But for kids now, they need to see it. And I think that having a bank of libraries like you have is great. And then being the ability to quickly and efficiently and affordably record them and then get that feedback back to them is super critical. Yeah. Yeah. I'm an, I'm an Apple user all the way. I mean, I know some, some coaches don't necessarily want to use their phone, which is why I have an iPad. But I mean, underwater cases, even Apple iPhones now are waterproof. As long as you have a pole, you can get it into the water. You can very quickly record a video. And then Apple to Apple, I air I airdrop stuff all the time. So I'm like, you got your cell phone? All right, here you go. And constantly I'm just sending stuff to my parents. So I hope eventually there is the ability to get the quality of footage that you just saw in a way easier manner than like an actual camera that is under the water with an SD card that I have to go back and edit all the files and then rename them like that process. Most coaches like don't have time to do. And I just happen to do that because that's what my business is run from. So it's like, I, you know, but at some point I would like technology to be where I, everything else on land is. It's like, come on, let's figure out this water situation here. And uh, I spent a couple summers up in Indiana on a I use pool deck and Ray Luce has a system. I can't remember the name of it, but it's essentially like an, one of the old TiVo systems, mm -hmm. but it has an underwater record or underwater video and an above water video that's being streamed on like a 15 second delay. So yeah. every one of those swimmers, as they come in, they touch the wall, they look at the camera and they can see their catch and they can see a good underwater glimpse of it. And uh, Ray started to explain to me the process of like, setting those up and purchasing them. And I was like, my $1,500 general supplies budget is not going to cut this Ray. So, um, yeah. But and the best part is Ray has 11 of those. Um, yeah. And it, that's like, the funny part is, is that's actually like a pretty new software, but it's like TiVo reinvented. So it's like the yeah. same thing. Um, yeah. but yeah, they're a couple thousand dollars each. So like who can afford that? But what we did do, and it was cheap was we found, you know, garage sale, 50 inch, TV, LED TV, mm -hmm. um, you know, 50 bucks. And then we got a uh, mount to, to put it on our pool deck, which was another 50 bucks. And we bought an Apple TV, which is what the software was being run on. Mm -hmm. And now, just like you said, like Apple to Apple, I can oh, take yeah. a video with my iPad and then I can screen mirror it to the TV. So mm -hmm. now if I'm working with more than one athlete, because I'm a high school coach, I've got 40 kids in the water at a time. Yeah. Um, I can pull five and have one do it. And then we can watch that one all at the same time on a big 50 inch television. Yeah. Um, and that was something that I already had an iPad because of my job in curriculum. 
and um, just get getting that two hundred dollar Apple TV set up was really really simple to do. So um, mm-hmm. that's something that's helped us, and it's something that my former assistant coach who just got a head coaching job. I'm really excited for her, but um, that was her strength was she had the ability to kind of go in and work with kids to make them do things they couldn't normally do. And I will be taking on that challenge this year, uh, which is what she had. So um, I need to get better at that. The actual, like the wet part of coaching is what I called it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. No. And kudos to you for getting that set up. Like, I mean, that's something that, uh, you know, most coaches don't know how to connect most of that technology together. So the fact that you're even using that, that lingo in those terms, like that is accelerating you to be a part of the 140 character generation. Cause it is <laughs> to me, I feel like it's kind of adapt or, you know, you're going to be in the dust and I don't, I don't see technology going anywhere. I don't see social media going anywhere, anywhere fast. Like I just think that it's more, so this is going to be more involved in these generations moving forward and the way we deliver our information has got to adapt to fit into that mold. I agree. So Abby, you talked about your business a little bit. What are some ways that people can connect with you and Swim Like a Fish? Yeah, so Swim Like a Fish is an online virtual swim coaching business. Uh, We have a website. It's swimlikeafish.org. Got a bunch of free stuff on on there. We've got blogs. We've got much much more videos, tutorial videos. Uh, So feel free if you're listening to poke around if you've never been to my site. Uh, and then also I'm super active on social media, um, predominantly Instagram. Um, my Instagram handle handle is at the T H E a fish one. And then I'm also on Facebook, um, at a fish one and then Twitter. Uh, so yeah, definitely feel free to poke around the website. See if you follow me on social media. If you don't, I would love for you to follow me. And then if you have any questions, uh, my email is on all of those things. Uh, I'm an open book and I would love, love to hear from you. Yeah, and we will put all of Abby's contact information and her website links in the show notes on the YouTube video and on the, uh, the Spotify or Apple podcast uh, description. Um, so, Abby, I like to finish every podcast with the same question. And um, unfortunately, I've been falling off my podcast wagon lately. Um, <laughs> so the question's changed a little bit. It's how do you coach kids in COVID? Now it's how are you adapting your coaching coming out of COVID? Ooh, that's a solid one. You know, I had a feeling that you were going to do this because I was like, we didn't get any questions prior to this. So I was like, there's going to be like a hot seat question. So here's my hot seat. Um, Well, I would say one thing. So I did a a bunch of those lessons the other day, as I said, and one kid's family had a, um, a sibling that was at risk or high risk. And so they really didn't do much. Um, my actual club team though was pretty blessed. We were out of the water for like eight weeks and then we got back in and it was kind of like a roller coaster, but at least there was some sort of consistency. Um, and to me, understanding which of those kids were out of the water for like six, eight months, uh, is a very different style of kid and coaching than the kids that were only out for eight weeks. And so looking at his technique from where it was before he had this like half year gap to where he is now really gave me just like an entirely new process of thinking about him. So to me, the way I've looked at things now after understanding that not all the kids were the same approaching their break is understanding how long the break was and then what did they do during this break? Because some kids didn't do a whole lot of anything. And then there's other kids who did a whole lot of everything. So where, where are they? And then how do, how do we go from there? Cause you can't just zero to 100 if you've taken six months off. Yeah. And being able to differentiate is a skill that master coaches have. And it's something that if I had one thing to like, I just hired a brand new assistant coach and I'm excited for her. Uh, she is a former swimmer of mine. So I hired, I'm like, this is the first time I feel old. Um, but she said, she's like, what is like your biggest piece of advice? And I said, I think it's just swimming is so much more than just what you do, how you do it. it it's so much more about the relationships and being mm. able to pick up on nonverbal cues. And if a kid is overwhelmed, there's a reason they're overwhelmed. No yeah. kid goes to the pool to think to themselves like today, I'm going to suck. Like mm. I'm going to choose to be awful today. Um, that That's my biggest piece of advice to her is just, I want her to be a relationship magnet for these kids mm. and try to, if there's a problem that we both see, you're almost like being a, like a physician trying to diagnose it. 
Yeah. Um, and I, that, that's the biggest piece of it is each kid is different. And I've got 40 kids in my pool and they're 40 different ability levels and 40 different personalities and 40 different social emotional needs. And, um, that's, that's the hardest part about coaching right now, especially coming out of COVID. Oh yeah. Everybody I think has been dealt a hard hand. Like COVID may not have hit you directly, but you know, someone that it hit, or maybe it was your family or the peripheral of your family. So it's like, it's so weird for the whole world to have gone through the same struggle at the same time. Like normally when you go through a struggle, I'm not able to like empathize and sympathize with that. Cause I may not be going through it or maybe I did, but it was in the past. But the fact that we all just went through something transforming is a way to collectively come together and actually really um, uh, like understand each other. Like it can create a sense of connection way better than what it was before, in my opinion. We just had a, a speaker come and talk to our district as we released for the summer and his name's Hamish Brewer. And he took him on. He's like, I, I just want you guys to realize like what all you lived through. You lived through COVID. You like a global pandemic. You lived through political unrest and social justice uh, pushes. And like, there are all of these like magnanimous moments in human history that have been going on mm-hmm. throughout a global pandemic. And then in yeah. Texas, we had this huge freeze that happened that kind of has made, you know, some political economic issues become more prevalent where mm-hmm. there's like issues with the electric grid. And um, it kind of hit our whole school district hard where we were like, yeah, you know, maybe, maybe our star scores, our standardized test scores aren't that important in the grand scheme of things. And maybe it's, you know, how many kids you get to go to zones or futures or how many kids qualify for junior nationals isn't as important as the relationships that are going on on a day-to-day basis. I totally, I totally agree. Well, Abby, I appreciate you coming on the podcast. Anything else you want to share with listeners? No, just thank you so much for the time. I enjoyed chatting with you face-to-face and all that and making this happen. I mean, this has been in the work since uh, September since the Ask a World Clinic. So yes. that's when you and I first connected. <laughs> Bring it back almost a year later. It's only nine months. Only nine months. That's yeah. <laughs> my fault. Sorry, Abby. It's all right. Well, uh, thank you guys for listening. Be sure to check out the uh, YouTube video if you did not and you were just listening to the podcast because Abby had some great still frames and some slow motion videos to for you guys to check out. And we'll see you guys next time. Bye.